Once again, welcome to Summit. In the event you missed us two Sundays ago, or if you could benefit from a brief recap, two weeks ago we took a look at Jesus' final public appearance in Matthew 23, before he is tried, arrested, and crucified. In this final public appearance, Jesus raises his voice in a scathing rebuke against the leaders of Jerusalem, addressing their hypocrisy and hostility towards God and man. As we saw, this text needed very little explanation, and our primary focus was application, recognizing that although we don't necessarily struggle with the same things, nor struggle to the same extent, the rebuke targeted towards them ought to be heeded by us as well. Jesus' seven woes can be summarized as follows. Woe to those who exalt yourselves in pride rather than humble yourselves in servility. Woe to you who shut the door to heaven while swinging wide the gates of hell. Woe to you whose life revolves around your possessions while treating God as light and frivolous. Woe to you who major in the minors and neglect the weightier things of God. Woe to you who create a veneer of righteousness, but inwardly are full of greed and self-indulgence. And finally, woe to you who praise those who are righteous while ignoring their instruction and example. After reading this text, it was easy for us to see our inconsistency with it. We, like they, fall short of God's standard, which then drives us to ask how our debt might be rectified. Fortunately for us, before the passage ends, Jesus extends an invitation to us to find refuge from the necessary wrath of God under the wings of the Savior, who in a few short days will go to bear the weight of our sin on the cross. The admonition of this text was the same admonition from every text in Matthew, which is a call to repentance, and then to bear fruit in keeping with that repentance. Today, we jump into Matthew chapter 24 for one of the hardest and trickiest texts in all of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, jump on over to Matthew chapter 24. Once again, good morning and welcome. If you've got your Bibles, feel free to flip on over to Matthew chapter 24. If you've been with us at Summit, you'll recall that we've been in the book of Matthew, and it's not lost on you that I have been kind of dreading teaching on Matthew chapter 24 and 25, seeing as today's chapter and next week's chapter has to do with eschatology. That is a $10 church word uh, dealing with the study of last things or the end times. Now, the th there are two things I'd like to draw your attention to initially about eschatology, and that is its challenge, but then also it's an encouragement to us. Uh, it's a challenging thing, and it's also encouraging. Now, why is it so challenging? because unlike the rest of Scripture, the majority of Scripture that you and I traffic in, we have typically a prophecy, and then we have its fulfillment. And it's awesome because through those two things, we understand both the fulfillment and the prophecy. We see how they work together. Uh, the thing that makes today very challenging is we have prophecy, but we yet, by and large, do not have fulfillment. And so it's hard to um, necessarily uh, see how all of these things will work together. Um, this is, uh, as you can imagine, challenging. Imagine for a moment um, uh, an Old Testament Israelite hearing the prophecy given to Abraham, which in, back in Genesis 15, God says to Abraham, know for certain that I'm going to give you a bunch of offspring, and those offspring will be sojourners in a land not their own for 400 years, but after they serve them under great oppression, I will bring the Israelites out back to the land of Canaan, where they will then be the conduit by which I bring the justice and wrath of God against the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Gerbeshites, the Jagazites, all the Jezites in Canaan, that's the prophecy that's given to Abraham when he doesn't even yet have one single child. Imagine hearing that prophecy and imagining how the Lord is going to actually bring that to fruition. Imagine further down the road when you're an Israelite in the land of Egypt, suffering for 300, 400 some odd years, and wondering if and when God is going to come uh, prove to be true to his word. Even imagine just a few short days before Moses gets sent back to the land of Egypt, where he's told by God that he's going to send Moses back, a man who struggles with speaking well, 
to be the mouthpiece of God, where God is going to work some incredible plagues through Moses so as to harden Pharaoh's heart and then break Pharaoh's heart through a series of plagues culminating in a Passover event in which a lamb will die so that the Israelites don't have to. I mean, imagine just hearing the prophecy and then trying to see how that prophecy in any way, shape, or form is going to come to fruition. It's incredibly difficult. By and large, when you and I read through Scripture, we don't have to wrestle with those things because we see prophecy and then we see fulfillment. Um, So that's what makes today's passage so difficult is we see prophecy, but we don't yet see fulfillment, so we don't necessarily know how it's all going to work together. Does that make sense? But not only does that therefore make this today's text challenging, but it also kind of makes today's text exciting, encouraging, and comforting. Because I don't know about you, but there are often times when I'm reading through Scripture and I marvel. I'm almost jealous or envious of those in the Old Testament who got these prophecies from God and had not yet seen how those things would come to fruition. And there's a part of me that longs to be back there, that longs to almost be an Israelite in slavery, longing for the deliverance of the Lord so that when it comes, I get to see it firsthand. And there's this like excited anticipation I have that one day God will be true to his word to me. By and large, for you and I, in Scripture, that doesn't apply. But in the conversation related to eschatology in end times, that does apply. Where we finally, too, also have a promise given to us by God that we get to sit and wait in eager expectation, longing for him to fulfill those things. So it is challenging, what is laid before us today, is also kind of encouraging, exciting. Uh, it ought to build up a type of anticipation for us as well, saying God has been true to every single promise he has given in the past. I'm looking forward to him being true to these promises as well. Does that make sense? Um, That is why today is both challenging and encouraging. Before we jump into the text itself, um, I'd like to maybe give us a little bit of an overview of um, the basic six components that typically comprise eschatology. I'm going to show you the three most popular models, uh, schools of thought when it comes to how the Lord might bring these things together. And then we're going to jump into the text and show how that text weighs into those different components. Um, You will walk away from today's message with more questions than you have answers. Um, But that's why I told you not to bring any friends, okay? All right? That's all I have to offer. Okay, when it comes to eschatology, uh, technically, this is very interesting, but technically when it comes to eschatology, typically you do not address the eternal state. The eternal state is what happens um, at the end of time as we know it, where uh, we are brought before the Lord, we are judged based on what we did uh, with his person, his word, and his works, and that results for us either in eternal life with Christ or eternal damnation and judgment, suffering under the wrath of God. Uh, This, technically, eschatology is everything that builds up to this event, but this is in today's text, or at least in Matthew 25. Uh, This is within the scope of the conversation. And so uh, when we talk about eschatology, it is helpful to talk about the eternal state, where people go and where they go forever, so to speak. That's on the table. Another thing on the table is um, the resurrection. When we're talking about resurrection and eschatology, we're not really talking about Christ's resurrection, though that is a model for believers' resurrection down the line. We're not simply talking about a believer's resurrection. We're actually talking about the resurrection of all people, both good and bad, righteous and wicked, being uh, the undead, or sorry, the dead being made undead, being brought before the Lord, commonly referred to at a point called the great white white throne judgment, where we are judged for what we did in response to the person, work, and word of God, which will establish the eternal destination for uh, where we will find ourselves, either life with Christ or life suffering under the wrath of God. The resurrection is a part of eternal uh, eschatology. Where is the second coming of Christ? There it is, you're wondering. It's been here the whole time. Uh, One other thing, uh, another thing we talk about when it comes to eschatology is the second coming of Christ. Now, by and large, especially here at Summit, we spend the majority of our time talking about Christ's first advent, his first coming, being born in Bethlehem and eventually dying in Golgotha. We spend a lot of time focusing on that. However, you should know this. There was a time in which I talked to a young, early uh, believer in which they had shared with me that they never knew that Christ was coming back for them. 
They just assumed he came once and that maybe when they would die, they would see him again, but they never realized that he was actually coming back to judge, as scripture testifies to both the quick and the dead. Uh, Christ will return. All people will stand before him and the Father, and based on what they did with him, his person, his work, his words, it will establish their eternal destiny. These three components are a part of eschatology. Now here's why I'm going to stop here for half a second and say this. Um, In order to be orthodox... At the end of today's conversation, you may be thoroughly confused by what we're talking about, and that's fine. We'll join the club, okay? Um, But at the end of the day, if you're wondering, what do I need to cling to? What do I need to know? You need to, if you claim to be a believer, you need to know and recognize these three things. If you want to have confidence in salvation, you need to recognize Christ is going to return for his people. All people, both good and bad, will stand before him and be judged based on what they did with the character of the Lord, and they will be sent then to an eternal destiny. This um, is Christian orthodoxy that the church has held uh, uh, since its advent. Um, This is something you need to cling to. At the end of the day, this is bare minimum standard. If you hold this, you're orthodox. The rest of the things that we're going to be talking about um, have a nuance and meaning, and we need to talk a little bit about definition, and um, you're not, you won't be held and a pass-fail on these types of things. Here we go. Another component of eschatology is the millennium. This is largely drawn from Revelation 20. Um, If you're familiar with this title, this is typically referring to the thousand-year reign and rule of Christ over all that is his. Um, That's as much as I can say on that right now. We'll get to more of it in just a minute. Uh, And when it comes to eschatology, many of us grew up in a tradition that adheres to something referred to as the rapture. Rapture literally is drawing upon the Greek word that means catching up. This means that we are catching up to Christ, that um, we effectively meet him midair as he comes close to the earth, not necessarily at all times his, the fullness of his second coming, but that the believers, both living and dead, are drawn to him. That's the rapture. More on that in a little bit. And then f- typically, finally, for now, um, there is, when it comes to the end time, a conversation related to the tribulation. Tribulation, um, obviously drawing upon its source word, being a time of significant suffering on the earth. These are the six components that typically make up the conversation related to end times and eschatology. Now, you may be asking, well, what about the beast? What about the antichrist? What about the two prophets? What about the plagues? What about the bowls? What about the trumpets? Um, those, uh, those boxes can typically be filed under these boxes, so to speak, and will be, on, be beyond the scope of our conversation today because a lot of that is Revelation-type talk, and that's not where Matthew 24 is. Um, these are the six components. The next question that I would imagine is bubbling up in your mind is, how do these components work together? I'm not even going to pretend. This is not even an, an introduction to eschatology. This is an introduction to the introduction to the introduction of eschatology. Um, By the end of today, you should probably have nothing settled. Um, If you don't have it settled already, this is just familiarizing you with the conversation. Um, If you do have something settled in your mind, that is totally fine. If I say something that contradicts your eschatological model, I am not intending to do so, and I will not fight with you when you come in my office and tell me I got it wrong. I'll say, please tell me how I got it wrong. I'm totally fine with that. That having been said, I do want to show you the three most common eschatological models so as to maybe connect with you and your church tradition so that you can at least say, yeah, I think I was trained up in that or I think I've heard that before or just basically get us a timeline because I think that's helpful. I don't actually even know if that's going to be helpful, but we're going to try it anyway. You guys cool with it? All right. When it comes to eschatological um, models, there are typically three that have been um, three schools of thought, three that are popularized, three that you may recognize and resonate with, two more, uh, two of them more than one. I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, before we begin, I'll talk about what's not really a part of eschatology, which is what's referred to as the church age. This is, so I'm about to build a timeline up here. You're going to love it. And by the end of it, we're going to know the day, time, and hour in which Christ returns. It's going to be awesome. No, I tease. That is uh, <clears throat> that's not what's going to happen. But uh, if, if this were a timeline, you and I would be somewhere on this thing, right? Okay? We live in a time that is commonly referred to as the church era, which was inaugurated at the death, 
burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ that was really kicked off at Pentecost, uh, which was the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is contrasted with, um, this is this is consistent with new covenant type language that is contrasted with old covenant type language where God primarily worked, um, I'm going to say primarily, pseudo-exclusively uh, worked with Israel. But this changed upon the arrival of Christ and you and I find ourselves somewhere along here, all right? No matter the model that we talk about, by and large, we would describe where we're at right now as the church era. The first eschatological model that we're going to talk about is something called ah millennialism. Um, ah, millennialism, if you know Latin, might suggest that this group does not believe in a millennium. That is not true or accurate. They do believe in a millennium, but they do not believe in a literal, physical manifestation of that millennium uh, here on the earth. They believe that Christ is reigning and ruling for a thousand years roughly, but reigning and ruling currently in a spiritual sense with the saints in a type of heaven or paradise, he's reigning and ruling in a way in which we down here on earth cannot see, but it most certainly is real. When they read Revelation 20, they're saying all those things are going on currently as um, he oversees the affairs of man today. Does that make sense? Uh, he sees us, we can't see him. There is a millennial kingdom that's affirmed, um, but it is largely spiritualized. Uh, there's a lot of allegory when they read Revelation 20 and the passages similar to it. Uh, they do affirm as they sure should, one day this age will end at the second coming of Christ when he comes. And when he comes, he will draw all men, both living and dead, believers and non-believers, unto himself for what is kind of commonly referred to as the great white throne judgment, which will then determine the eternal state of individuals. You guys track it with me? We are here. Christ is currently reigning and ruling according to an amillennial structure. Um, uh, he will one day come, people will stand before him, and then that will determine our eternal state. The one component that is currently missing from this model that is important to talk about is they do believe in and affirm a tribulation. Um, and I put it like this uh, because they believe that the tribulation is occurring and will be escalating the suffering of the church and of believers and of human beings over time, will be escalating to a particular culminating point that Christ will come down to and bring a decisive end to. Does that make sense? This is an amillennial model. If you don't know what model you were trained up in or what you adhere to, it's likely that by default, you've probably landed in a model pretty similar to this, which... Uh, affirms the second coming, affirms the resurrection, um, affirms the eternal state, believes that things are going to get significantly more difficult, believes that Christ is currently reigning and ruling, but will never come and reign and rule in an earthy sense on earth, as some other models believe we'll get to in just a minute. But this is all millennialism in a nutshell. You guys track it with me? All right, now when is Christ going to come back? Okay, somebody give me a date. Anybody got anything? No, okay, all right. Um, up next is not all millennialism, but post-millennialism. As you can tell uh, from what the name suggests, they believe that Christ is coming after the millennium. So if they were to build out a timeline or a chart, it might look something like this. Now, how post-millennialists are unique is they do not believe that Christ will be coming down physically to inaugurate and kick off the millennial age, but rather it will be the church with the gospel led by the spirit that will bring about a, um, a utopian age of sorts where um, the gospel will go forth, the world will by and large over time imbibe and receive Christ and will largely be Christianized. Now, what's a little tricky in their model is, um, depending on who you talk to, it's not clear how far along we are, but I'll put it this way. Right now, if you were to go 2,000 years in the future from wherever we currently find ourselves, you would be able to notice that the world is getting significantly or increasingly better because the gospel is going forth and it is converting hearts, minds, um, cultures, societies, governments to be in greater conformity to Christ. This will eventually culminate in a type of Edenic state, um, a, a utopia of sorts, and it's once this has reigned and ruled and largely dominated the earth, that's when Christ will come and return. 
So they described the millennium as a time in which not Christ himself, but that the church with the gospel, with God's word, led by his spirit, will convert and redeem the majority of um, humanity. And Christ will come at the end. He will then draw all people unto himself for judgment, which will determine the end eternal state of the individuals. You guys track it with me? It is unlikely that unless you've been trained in this model and you come from a covenantal background, you probably don't naturally land here. Uh, this is uh, typically of, uh, of a covenantal variety. Um, this typically, uh, if you're Presbyterian or... Um, there's a lot of other things that are associated with this that by and large knowing are people we don't necessarily traffic in. Uh, you're going to find, uh, this, is, this isn't going to talk badly of them, but um, y there, are a lot more, uh, there are a lot of other implications involved to receive this model, including baptizing your children. So if you're like, I'm not into baptizing my children, this is probably not the eschatological model you adhere to. <laughs> Track it with me? All right, post-millennialism. <clears throat> oh wait, this is important. What do they do with the tribulation? Uh, it's a little tricky, depends on who you ask. But by and large, what I have found is when they read tribulation passages, uh, passages regard, related to suffering and the hardship that the church is going to face, typically they believe that that will pop up in different places at different times as the church advances uh, and as it advances against the darkness of this world, there will be suffering. But typically when they see um, suffering-type passages, they believe that that came <clears throat> and was fulfilled um, at the time of the Jewish revolt, which we'll be spending a lot of time talking about today, in 68 AD, roughly to 72, 73 AD, where the Jews revolted against Rome, and Rome came down with a heavy hand to absolutely nearly exterminate uh, Jerusalem and uh, the Jews at the time. They believe when they read passages about great suffering in Scripture, that that suffering was largely fulfilled during the time around the Jewish revolt of 68 AD, uh, where Rome came down with a heavy hand to almost entirely uh, extinguish Judaism as we know it, the destruction of the temple, stuff like that. You guys tracking with me so far? That'll be relatively important as we engage in today's passage, which talks about that exact same event. Cool? All right. That's post-millennialism in a nutshell. You probably don't adhere to that unless you know that you do. Um, and uh, now we're to our most complicated model yet, uh, I'll let you know right now, this is my bias. This is what I was trained up in. Uh, this is maybe what the model that you were trained up in as well. I will not die for this timeline or this model. I will not kill for this timeline or model. But if at the end of the day, you put a gun to my head and say, what do you ascribe to? I would say I ascribe to premillennialism. What is premillennialism? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. We're going to start saying ah mill, post mill, pre mill. All right, you guys cool with it? We're going to now talk about the pre mill model, which is premillennialism. Whew, I crushed it. All right. Um, <clears throat> premillennialism uh, sounds as it's described, which is Christ coming uh, before the millennium. Now, before we get there, though, they believe that we, uh, I'll say we, we believe that we are currently right here. At some point, <clears throat> there will be what is referred to as the Great tribulation. Am I going to stay? Nope. All right. Oh, we just lost the eternal state. Oh, man. It's gone. It's gone. Sorry. All right. Give me two seconds and we'll get this thing right. <clears throat> all right. For some, that will be true. Okay. All right. It's all a part of the model. Oh, man. All right. Hopefully not me. Okay. All right. <clears throat> for premillennialism, what they believe is we are currently here um, at some point, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, the tribulation is inaugurated and it starts and it begins. They believe that Christ will be coming at the end of the tribulation before the millennium. Uh, I can't do it without addressing this component right here. Um, the, typically the inaugurating event that they see kicking off the tribulation is the rapture, which is when believers, uh, by and large they typically believe this, um, which is when believers, both living and dead, uh, are brought up to Christ uh, to live in a type of uh, paradise of sorts during the seven <clears throat> years of tribulation. They will be with him uh, until he decides to come back and with finality bring justice and judgment to the world. Okay? 
Typically, if you grew up in a tradition that talks about the rapture, or if you grew up in a tradition that talks about seven years, that is oftentimes associated with premillennialism, as when they read Daniel, when they read Revelation, they figure that this period lasts for about seven years. This is typically where you have large conversations about the Antichrist, about the beast, about the plagues, about the bulls, about the trumpets. That typically takes place during this period until Christ comes back to dominate his enemies with finality and then ushers in what is then called the millennial kingdom, which is the physical, actual reigning and ruling of Christ on the earth for a thousand years. Uh, during that thousand years, uh, pre-mill, uh, followers of pre-mill believe uh, this is a sharp distinction, so if you have a particular affinity or a church tradition that has an affinity for Israel, it's likely that you were trained up with a pre-mill background because uh, pre-millennialists believe that the Lord has a tangible, actual future for Israel where in the millennial kingdom, he will bring to fruition all the promises he's both given the church and the specific promises he's given Israel throughout the Old Testament typically pertaining to land, a seed, and a blessing. As a premillennialist pre -millennialist reads their Bible, they recognize that Abraham, by and large, never got to receive the promises that God gave him of a particular land allotment. And they say, as I think we should say, God is always true to his promises, and therefore for will one day deliver to Abraham the land that he was promised. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> So there's a heavy emphasis on the saints are raised to come return with Christ, bring finality and justice to the world, usher in the new, the new millennial kingdom upon which the Lord is true to his promises to Israel. We're talking to very tangible, very earthy promises where he reigns and rules with the saints and or also on over perhaps with Israel during this season upon which there is a resurrection where it is not the Righteous who are then raised because they've already effectively been raised, um, but the wicked are raised. There's a great white throne judgment that then determines the eternal state of what an individual did with the person, work, and word of Christ. You guys track it with me, roughly making sense a little bit? I would imagine um, if you don't yet know where you stand, and please, you should not look at these three models and right now be saying, well, which one do I like best? And I'm going to pick that one. That's not how this whole thing works. These are three attempts for us to put together the prophecies that have been given about the end times, and these are largely the three schools of thoughts. Um, these are the rough categories of three schools of thought um, trying to describe what we see in Scripture. One last thing. Um, we've now talked ah-mill, post-mill, pre-mill. Now we'll talk uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, which... What that's talking about is that is then talking about the timing of the rapture upon which the Lord will gather up his saints. Some people, and I would put myself in this category, would say they're pre-tribulationists, pre-trib. Some are mid-trib. If I'm not mistaken, um, Joseph Barlow in Joseph is a mid-tribber guy. So if you want to go hang out with him and talk mid-trib stuff, you're more than welcome to. He'd be super excited. Uh, or post-trib, that Christ is coming at the end, all right? These are typically the three systems why, did I, why do I share all this with you? I think maybe because somehow it possibly might help us. Um, or, <clears throat> to be honest with you, again, I took this eschatology class. And it, I mean, it, like, <clears throat> it was like 120 hours of consuming different material and stuff like that. And I just didn't want it to go waste. You know what I mean? So <laughs> this, is, this, has been, this is justice for me right here. But these are the three models. Now, today, if you notice, we haven't even read the text yet. Um, but we're about to. I'll share with you that today, Matthew 24 and 25 does not weigh in on all these different components, but it does weigh in on pretty heavily four different uh, components. What are those components? It, by and large, does not weigh in on the rapture. There is a part within this text that we're probably not going to read today, but we will read next week, that talks about people being taken up. But if you look at the context in Matthew 24, they're not being taken up in a positive way. It looks like it's a time of judgment. So by and large, typically, depends on who you talk to, uh, the rapture is not within view of uh, the text. The church age kind of is by natural default, but that's not different than what we normally see in Matthew. So that's not a component that we're necessarily talking about. We are talking significantly about the tribulation. We are talking significantly about, is this right side up? Nope. Um, <clears throat> we are talking about the second coming. 
There's an allusion maybe to the millennial kingdom and state, but it's not largely in view. Again, the primary text for that is Revelation 20. But the four components that we'll be looking at today are, I keep getting it wrong, the resurrection, the eternal state, we'll get to this both today, maybe a little bit, and next week significantly, the second coming and the tribulation. I think Matthew 24, when it talks about eschatology in this passage, doesn't talk about all the components, but it does weigh in heavily on these four. As Here's what we're about to do. I'm going to read through the text. We're not covering every single verse. Um, it would be... Uh, well beyond what we have time for this morning, well beyond what we have time for this summer, even this year. And it's beyond my capabilities to be able to parse out where every verse is. But I'll give you the general categories. I'll give you what we can glean from Matthew 24, and then I'll allow you this week to get in the text yourself and see how the different verses we'll read apply to these different components. Is that fair? All right. That having been said, let's read the text for this morning. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. I don't think I'm going to be reading all of it, Miss Jenny. I'll cut us off at some point because... Um, Christ may come back before I'm done with this message, all right? <clears throat> Chapter 24. Jesus left the temple <clears throat> and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, you see these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be here left, left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And he sat on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, <clears throat> and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold." but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet of Daniel, prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to, his, to take his cloak." And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not yet been cut short, had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. <clears throat> Not even the angels of heaven, 
nor the Son, but the Father only. Matthew 24 is going to go on and then bleed into Matthew 25. Um, For our time purposes and because we're going to be attacking a lot of Matthew 25 next week, I'm going to stop there um, as that then begins to bleed into application. But today, let's talk about principles. Um, All I want to do for the next few minutes is, again, give you some context for this conversation, um, showcase to you maybe um, the context of the greater conversation, and then allow you, if should you be interested, to then piece through this passage yourself and apply different verses to get different components to see if you can figure out how it all works together, and you can come back next week and tell us when you think Christ will be coming. All right? Does that work? Here's the context. Matthew 23, Jesus has just gone off on the Pharisees. In a way in which we have not seen him go off on anybody else, he is consistently, as we saw two weeks ago, calling out these guys by saying, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, you blind guides and you hypocrites. And at the end of Matthew 23, he draws their attention to the fact that he says, look, your house lays down desolate before you. And then he basically almost uh, dusts his uh, feet off and walks out of the temple. Does that make sense? Where we just jumped into Matthew 24 is the disciples are following him out of the temple. Now, this is just Dave's speculation, but it appears to me as though they see that Jesus is in a very, very, very bad mood, and he's very upset, and he's frustrated. And they would like to attempt to cheer him up. Now, If it were me, here's why I'm convinced that that day was not a good weather day. Because if it were me, if I were trying to cheer Jesus up, I'd be like, man, that was kind of crazy what the Pharisees did. But man, what a beautiful day, huh? And you try and like uplift your spouse or you try and uplift an individual by drawing attention to the beauty of the weather that day. So, but it was a crummy weather day, so they don't have that. So what do they turn to? Did you see in the text? They turn to the temple. Jesus is upset. I'm really under the impression they're trying to cheer him up and say, hey, Look on the bright side, Jesus. Here's the silver lining. At least the temple is beautiful. Have you seen this place? Now, it's so ironic because that is his house. He's the one who directed how it ought to be built, and they're the ones who are turning and drawing his attention to the beauty of it. But their attempts to cheer him up do not work because how does Jesus respond? He basically turns to them and says, truly, truly, I say to you, recognize this. This place will eventually be destroyed. And there will not be, at some point in the near future, there will not be one stone left upon another. It will be utterly decimated. Okay, now, this ought to be encouraging to you and I. Because when we read today's text, we get confused about how it all comes to fruition. But I want to draw your attention to this. You know better than the disciples knew how to understand at least parts of today's text because you're privy to something that they were not privy to at the hearing of Jesus saying this, nor at Matthew's reading. And what is that? Uh, Whether you know this or not, in 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and has been destroyed even up until the present day. So Jesus, in this text, says to them, they say, wow, isn't it beautiful? And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't understand. It's going to be absolutely destroyed. And they're over here saying, the temple is pretty darn substantial. Uh, It's tough to move those stones. How in the world, when in the world, why in the world would the temple be destroyed? But you know, because of history, what they don't know, and therefore you have a little bit of insight in this text that they didn't have, at least upon its initial reception. And what is that? It is not lost upon you that in the Gospels, the Jews are not a fan, not big fans of the Romans, and they're perpetually trying to throw the yoke of the Romans off of their neck. And so around the time of 68 AD, the Jews revolted against Rome, thinking that they could basically drive off Julius Caesar, drive off the Romans, and regain Jerusalem and all of Israel and be an independent state once again. But Rome responded with absolute brutality. And the, now you're going to be able to see components of this text, the armies of Rome gathered around the city and they came in and utterly slaughtered and obliterated everything that was in Jerusalem, including the temple. Now, history tells us, um, the prophecy is literally what Jesus says, is no stone will be left one upon the other. Uh, History tells us that apparently what happened at some point 
is the Romans threw a torch into the temple. There were a lot of things in the temple that could burn and burn hotly. And so as it caught fire, if there's anything else, what, what is one component that is found in the temple that you would not find a lot of other places? Gold. So as the fires heat up, the gold melts. And this is what history, not what scripture tells us, but what history tells us, the gold melts and it seeps into the um, temple floor, so to speak, seeps into the entire structure so that by the time Rome is done destroying the city, they get greedy. They want the gold. So what do they do? They go and they lift every single stone and they topple it out so as to fish out the gold. This is not, I mean, this is, this is history. This, is, this will be um, validated in your history books, not even in scripture, to where in 70 AD, you and I are privy to something that they're not privy to, which is the temple was utterly destroyed. The stones were literally turned over, and to this day, it has not been reclaimed or rebuilt. Um, you and I are privy to that. They were not. That's comforting to me because if you walk away from today's text a little confused, uh, at least you're not as confused as these guys were upon the hearing of this text. That is a component that largely plays into today's conversation. So Jesus says, you guys think the temple is beautiful? In 40 years, it's not going to be here. Now, you should, that should be triggering something in your mind if you've been with us at Summit, because we perpetually talk about there are several numbers in Scripture that you need to be keenly aware of. Seven is helpful. Twelve is sometimes helpful. Three is helpful. Forty is typically a period of testing. Uh, Noahic flood reigned 40 days, 40 nights. Israelites in the wilderness, 40 years. Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days. 40 is a period of testing. This is crazy because Christ either started his ministry or died around 30, anywhere from 30 to 33 AD. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. 30 AD, 70 AD, the gap between 40 years, a period of testing. So what is going on in between that time is the Lord is quite literally testing the Israelite people saying, I've now given you the Messiah, what are you going to do with him? Will you receive him or will you reject him? And we're on the heels of Matthew 23 where it looks as though they're going to reject him and history will testify to the fact that by and large they rejected him. And so in 70 AD, the Lord brings in the Romans to utterly destroy the Jews, disperse the Jews and destroy the temple. It hasn't been built recent. Uh, it hasn't been rebuilt since. You guys track it with me? Um, that is what Jesus is talking about when he's alluding to the stones being toppled. Now, what will then drive the rest of this conversation is when the disciples hear that, they have a context that you and I are not as familiar with, which is they're importing uh, language, specifically from the book of Daniel, that refers to a time in which the Lord will bring judgment upon his people, sometimes referred to, often referred to, as the day of the Lord. So they just heard Jesus say, the temple's going to be destroyed. They recognize that the day of the Lord will be at the second coming of Christ when he will bring judgment upon the nations. And what are they doing in their minds? They're equating these two things. He just talked about the temple being destroyed. He must therefore be referring to the day of the Lord which is the second coming of Christ. So that now explains their question of, you said the temple will be destroyed. We know that you're going to bring judgment. Surely at your second coming, at the arrival of the, either the eternal state, the resurrection, maybe the millennial kingdom, at some point you're going to bring justice and that's going to be the day of the Lord when the end times happen and that's the last day. Does that make sense? They're equating the two. Destruction of the temple means the Lord is returning in times. Tracking with me? That drives their question. He just talked about the temple being destroyed. So now tell us, when is this going to happen? And what are some of the other signs that we can see that will mark or announce the coming of your kingdom and the end of the age? Does that make sense? That is so important to see because what Jesus is going to do is his question is largely target, targeted at um, uh, encouraging them not to conflate the two events, not to put them together. Because that's how Jesus responds. After they say, okay, destruction of the temple, son of man is coming, end times. When is that gonna happen? And Jesus says, literally the first thing out of his mouth is, see to it that no one leads you astray. He then goes on to talk about how there's gonna be false Christs, false prophets, and yet his arrival has not yet come. Okay, what, what was he doing? Um, 
Lord, help me. Here we go. He's saying, you guys are putting these two things together, destruction of the temple, the second coming of Christ. But although they are similar things, they are not the same. So important to see this. Although the tribulation that will be poured out on the land of Israel around 68 to 72 AD, although it will be an incredibly grave, difficult, bloody, dark season of suffering, it is not the final and last suffering. It is rather a small picture of the suffering yet to come. Because in 68 to 72 AD, this will be a localized expression of God's wrath against the Israelites for rejecting his son. But the great tribulation will be a globalized expression of God's wrath and judgment against the world that did not receive and imbibe his son. Does that make sense? So this text, it's fascinating how Jesus does this. Um, this text is weighing in on two events that are at the same time that are not the same. They're similar, not the same. This is why he can be, and I think, man, it's, um, that's, I think as far as I can confidently go without then putting my foot in my mouth to um, say this belongs to that and not the other. I think everything he shares in this text is, um, to one extent or another, weighing in on both events. They're saying, the destruction of the temple must mean that you're coming. He's saying, no, 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 no. The destruction of the temple is a response by God for Israel rejecting their Messiah. But one day, the great tribulation that will usher in the final second coming of Christ will be that, but on a global scale and on an ex exponentially greater scale, that's when the second coming, the Son of Man, is going to happen. Why does he tell him that? Because I think he's afraid that when Jerusalem gets sacked, if he doesn't inform his disciples, they're gonna think, oh no, the end is here. And so the next guy that shows up and says, hey, the temple's destroyed, Christ has come, now come and follow him, they're gonna begin following after a false Christ, a false Messiah, false prophets. Jesus is warning them, I'm not coming when the temple is destroyed, I'm coming when the world is destroyed. Does that make sense? Or I'm not coming just to destroy Jerusalem and the temple, I'm coming to uh, bring justice to the entire world. Does that make sense? Lest they be led astray. As I've been reading through Matthew 24, I think it's, this is maybe fair to say that Jesus is informing us as much, if not more, of what will not be, more so than he is informing us of what will be during the end times. And the thing he's making abundantly clear to these guys is, listen, when you see the temple being destroyed, that is not the end. And so if someone tries to convince you that that is the end and that I've come and that you should now, this is why he says, when someone says that Christ is in the inner rooms, don't go follow him. When Christ is, when they say he's in the woods, don't go follow him. When he's off in the wilderness, don't go follow him. Christ is now making the distinction between uh, his first and second coming. I think he's then going on to inform what the second coming is. He's saying, in the first coming, I came subtle, I came humble, I came as a baby in the back of a barn, basically, where a few shepherds, some random Gentile wise men, knew I was there, but by and large, the nation of Israel and the world was not privy to my arrival. He said, if I don't inform you as to my second coming, you might think that that's how I'm coming the second time, so when someone comes and says, hey, we found the Christ, come and find him, you might follow them, but please recognize this, both disciples and believers today, when he comes back, he will make it abundantly clear to all people over all time that he has arrived. Does that make sense? They're kind of saying, when will this stuff be, and how will we know? And what are some of the signs? And Jesus is basically saying to them, uh, when I come, it will be abundantly clear to everyone. For my second coming is not like my first coming. First coming, subtle, humble, uh, secretive, almost, so to speak. Second coming, everybody's gonna know about it. That is going on to answer their question of when will this be? And he basically then goes on, the majority of the passage is spoken into of nobody knows. Nobody knows until everybody knows where I make it abundantly clear. This is what he's talking about as lightning is stretched from one end of the sky to the other. So the whole world will be privy to my arrival when I come to bring justice on the earth. How are we doing? Doing okay? All right. 
By and large, that covers the majority of today's text for us. That's about as specific as I can get. Maybe if you want to come entertain a conversation this week, we could talk about some other verses and how they apply and different things like that, but that's about as specific as I want to get on public record, all right? Okay? <laughs> which is, Jesus is describing the temple, which is a prophecy that we see has been fulfilled that the disciples themselves would experience. And unless he gives them a heads up, they're going to think that's the end of the world. They're going to begin looking for the Messiah, and they're not going to find the actual one. They're going to find false ones and begin following after that one. So Jesus must inform them, no, 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 my second coming, the destruction of Jerusalem will be a day of the Lord, but my second coming will draw in the day of the Lord. This is a localized destruction of the temple. One day there will be a globalized destruction of the world, as in this case, I judge them for rejecting me. In this case, I judge everybody for their rejection of me. Do not conflate the two, I think is what he's saying. The passage goes on to talk about great tribulation and suffering. It goes on to talk about his arrival and how we can't or shouldn't ever set dates. Um, spoiler alert, um, we shouldn't set dates because uh, only the Father knows when the Son will return. Okay, now I look at this text and I say, okay, I'm tracking with it a little bit. But I have like one big question, and it's this. It talks about suffering, which I'm not a big fan of, um, and I don't really want to experience, but what I'm gleaning from this text is that I really don't have any control over it. Um, whether it's the suffering of the world or the suffering of the church and the followers, I don't have a lot of control over that, so that's a problem I have, Jesus. Um, the other thing is, you're telling me I don't know when you're coming, and I don't have any control over that either. So my question, I think, becomes your question, which is, what am I, what, two questions, what am I supposed to do about the information that I've been given, and why are you giving me this information? The second question first, then the first question second. That's eschatology for you right there. <laughs> why is he telling us this? I think it is for our comfort and our encouragement that he has not abandoned us, that he will come and return from us, even when it could possibly appear as though all hell is broken loose and he has thoroughly, fully broken his promises to return for his people. He wants us to know, do not be alarmed. You are still the apple, the church is still the apple of my eye and I'm coming for you and I'm true to my word. So don't be deceived, don't be lazy, don't be discouraged, don't be disobedient, because despite what it looks like, I'm still coming for you. In addition to that, not only will I bring you redemption, but I will bring justice to the injustices of this world. The world will not, the, Satan, the flesh, and the world will not have the last laugh. I will bring justice to everything. So don't be discouraged, be comforted, I'm coming for you. Does that make sense? I think that's why he's telling, he's warning his children of what's yet to come and assuring us it has potential to get bumpy. Um, but even still, he will remain true to his promises and he will come for us. That is encouraging. Um, the sec that's why one of the reasons I think he tells us. Um, the other question I have is, what am I supposed to do in light of this? That question begins to be answered in the rest of Matthew chapter 24 and in Matthew chapter 25, which is what we'll tackle next week. If I've lost you along the way, here's what you need to know. Jesus Christ is coming back to judge both the living and the dead, the righteous and the wicked. Despite what the world looks like at times with great suffering, rampant unrighteousness, that likely will be getting worse and worse. He has not abandoned his people, nor has he abandoned his post, but one day, with finality, he's coming to deliver his people. The destruction of Jerusalem back in the day for these guys who experienced a holocaust of sorts, Jesus is saying that was not it. Now, for you also who maybe have experienced a holocaust in the past, you may have think, thought, to a certain extent, uh, Christ has come, and I have missed it, and now I'm floating in space. And what he's saying in this text is, no, 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 
Nobody knows when he's coming, but nobody knows until everybody knows where he will make it abundantly clear as he comes for his people and to judge those who have thoroughly, wholeheartedly rejected him. Does that make sense? Now, the question you should be asking is, okay, if I can't control the suffering and I can't control when he comes, what can I control? What can I be doing in the meantime? And that's where Matthew says, read on. That's what we're going to be talking about in Matthew chapter 25. Doing okay? Track with us so far? I'm going to pray for us. The band's going to come on up. We'll reflect on these truths as we praise the Lord. Um, and we'll go from there. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Uh, Lord, we ask that you come and bless the hearing of your word. Lord, I recognize that I could have easily uh, got things wrong, Lord, and for that I ask for your forgiveness, I ask for your mercy, and I ask that your spirit not allow those things to stick in our hearts or in our minds. Uh, Lord, this is your servant's feeble attempt to understand um, a word uh, that is not yet fully seen by us until you make it abundantly clear when you deliver on your promises. But Lord, in this we trust as your church that when you bring this about, we will look at your word and say, you perfectly described it. We missed it because we're not you. We don't have your insight. But when we see it come to fruition, we will describe your word as perfectly descri uh, describing what will come, and we will look at ourselves and say, how did we miss it? It was so abundantly clear. So Lord, in the meantime, for your feeble sheep, your feeble children, we ask that you come and strengthen us, Lord. Whether we ultimately suffer under a type of global tribulation, or whether we suffer with our personal tribulations, Lord, we ask that you come and encourage us by your word, that you have not abandoned your word, you have not abandoned your children, you have not abandoned your promises to us, Lord, but strengthen us in your spirit to do what saints of old have done, which is clinging to your word until you bring it about and we can say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord who delivers on his promises. Strengthen our hands. Encourage us by your spirit and by your word to get the gospel out so that no one rejects you in quote-unquote ignorance, Lord, but that they embrace you as you sought to embrace us through your cross and power us by your spirit to see these things and respond accordingly. We love you because you loved us first. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.